Hey, let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for our church. And we're just overwhelmed today with family and graduates and new life and new songs. And we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your faithful servants, those who've gone long before us on whose shoulders we stand. May we be found faithful in our day, in our time. And Lord, I pray a blessing over all of our graduates and families in these days of transition. I pray you give them great joy and comfort and great strength as they head into the world and be your representatives, your ambassadors all around the world. And Lord, now we ask that you would speak to us uh, through your word today. You have a word for us. And I pray that we'll humble ourselves before you. You'd speak to us. Lord, help me to get out of the way so your word will be heard and not only heard, but applied into every life here. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, in honor of our, um, our seniors, our graduates today, I wanted to offer a shout out to the class of 2041. Um, my grandson, I think we have pictures. Um, he, I think we have a pic. Okay. All right. So. We just, we're going to leave that up throughout the message. This is, this is little Henry Matthew McIntosh, who was born on Wednesday. Um, and so we have had a whirlwind of a couple of days. Our daughter, Whitney, um, we have twin daughters, you know, Emily and Whitney. Whitney has given birth to our first grandson. So many of you have been praying and rejoicing with us. We just wanted to celebrate with you. And if Stacy falls asleep during the message, um, you'll know why. She's falling asleep you know, during other messages, but uh, she, she has to hear me a lot. And so we are loving this. this. We've heard this, uh, Stace. We've, we've heard that it can't be overrated. And I think that's true. We, we can't quite overrate this thing. So we just want to celebrate with our, our church family. We love you all so much. Um, in about 18 years, uh, sure enough, uh, he's going to be graduating. We, we trust and, and pray and hope. So um, when I was in seminary, I, I had a class, a systematic theology class that you take. And um, in it, uh, the assignment from Dr. Kilpatrick was to um, write our, our theology uh, after a portion of time in the, in the semester, after reading a lot of historical theology, learning Orthodox Christianity, really understanding the Bible in greater ways and, and, and theology, we um, were then given an assignment to write uh, short papers on different aspects of theology. He called it a theological reconstruction. And each paper, so like theology, the doctrine of God, right? The uh, Christology, the doctrine of Christ, pneumatology, the doctrine of the spirit, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. We wrote papers and more about all of these things. And the premise of it all was that we've come to seminary with all our presuppositions um, like our, our graduates who, who many of us, you know, like me, I grew up kind of in, in one church, heard from maybe a single pastor or a couple of pastors and others were into my life, parents certainly, but really a rather, rather narrow view and the premise of it all with seminarians coming to seminary from all over the world, the idea was let's, let's break down some presuppositions. We didn't know the term at the time or I didn't, he didn't call it deconstruction. A deconstruction of what you believe in order to rebuild a reconstruction. Now, deconstruction is a buzzword and a popular phrase among evangelicals in our day because there's a lot of deconstruction going on, all the way to denouncing one's faith. And we've all heard the, the, you know, the, the real, real numbers, the real people, uh, young people who head off to college and then kind of uh, you know, drift away from the church, and for a lot of varying reasons. Uh, some deconstruction, I think, is, is appropriate, but deconstruction without reconstruction is tragic. And that's what's happening for a lot of people in our culture. I've studied a lot of this, read a lot about it, but I can tell you this, if, you're, if your deconstruction is without reconstruction, we're going to talk about this a bit today, it's a tragedy, and if the path you're on is not making you a more generous, compassionate, hopeful merciful person, then the destination is not worth the journey. And we're seeing this in spades in our day. How do we stay true? How do we know when someone gets it? 
and when they don't. How do you know if someone you're listening to, your pastor, teachers, others, visiting new churches, you head off in on the college campus or wherever you might go, we're dropping in on something online, social media, YouTube coming. How do you know if they get it or if they don't? Because Jesus teaches us that uh, it's, it's not all that meets the eye. We've got to be discerning. We've got to know how to discern. Now, the reason a lot of people deconstruct is, is what, uh, you know, again, another phrase that's used often in these days, church hurt, right? You've been hurt by the church. That's real. Uh, and and even, even the, the abuse within the church, those things are, are real. And if you've been in the church very long, like a lot of us, you're going to be hurt at some point. Or you're going you're gonna to bump up against... Uh, Some folks or or a pastor will disappoint you or a leader in the church may disappoint you. Or a member. This happens in churches because we are broken people worshiping a a perfect Savior who can redeem all things, even the worst of hurt. But but what happens too often, and I've seen it as a youth pastor and as a pastor, one of the ways that, that leads to a lot of deconstruction, even announcing a faith, is when a child grows up in a home where uh, they might be a church-going family, but then the faith is not lived out daily. That's that's a complete disconnect in the mind and heart of a young person. So no wonder, right, if someone heads off and says, well, I I don't know what real Christianity looks like because I know what it is to go to church and hear the truth and hear good doctrine and orthodox teaching, but I haven't seen it lived out so much. And of course, none of us do this perfectly and as parents we seek to point our kids to Jesus and it's why so many of our graduates are here but how can we live a life of wholeness and integrity this is for all of us how can what we say we believe match up with what we actually do in our lives because the disconnect is not only tragic eternity weighs in the balance as we'll see today from the words of Jesus so in Matthew chapter 7 you can turn there We're going to be in verses 15 through 23 that Kennedy read a moment ago. And I'm going to start with the verse 14, really place this in context a bit. Jesus is going to speak to us about two groups of people, false teachers, uh, false prophets, and false disciples. And he has been presenting this manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount. He's at the back end of it now. And he now is landing this thing of what it means to live in his kingdom. For him to be king and lord over our lives, a master of our lives. And he offers, I mean, a daunting challenge and what is one of the most disturbing passages in all of scripture and particularly even prior to that in verse 14. Matthew 7 verse 14, it says this. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. He says there's this road to destruction, eternal separation from God that's wide and many go that route. Listen to this. Few find the way of eternal life. He says that it's narrow, meaning it's exclusive. And and, and young people, I don't need to tell you, we we already know that, that people struggle with that one, right? Maybe we all do in varying degrees. It's exclusive, but let's unpack that for a moment before we get to the teaching, the the core passage for for our text today, because here's what happens. We we start to, to, to pull away from the gospel that is exclusive. Christ is the only way. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. In fact, it's it's core to our to the Christian faith. And it's so crystal clear at the beginning of the church, Peter becomes this great apostle who is speaking truth to power in Jerusalem to the council. And he says this in Acts 4, 12. You may know this. There's there's salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, let's let's unpack this for just a moment. A good word for for our graduates. Many struggle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. Tim Keller has noted, we've talked about this before, the gospel is actually the most inclusive exclusivity known to man. He writes this, the universal religion of humankind is this, we develop a good record, we give it to God, and he owes us. 
That's religion. That's philosophy in some form. But the gospel is God develops a good record. He gives it to us. Then we owe him. You see, he is the one who provides the perfect record in the person of Jesus, lives the perfect life. I've said it often. Just as central to your salvation is his death on the cross for your sin, the punishment that should have been yours coming to him. God is holy, just, and loving, and it all takes place as his love and our sin collide on the cross and redemption is made possible. But, but we've, we've said it often that it is It is true, just as central is the fact that he lived the perfect life for us. Jesus is not just our good example. He is our substitute, perfect life substituted for us. His good record instead of ours and salvation's made possible for us. And so see both, here's the point. If we say good people are in, bad people are out, This sounds apparently inclusive, but it's quite exclusive. What do you do with those of us who are moral failures? Any moral failures in here? Raise your hand. If you are, okay, yep. If you don't have your hand raised, you don't get it. We're gonna talk about that today. (laughs) You don't get it. And we're gonna see today, those who get it are those who don't get it. What I mean is those who know they're not good enough And so what do you do with the moral failure then in that scenario? The only other scenario apart from Christ. We're all excluded. See, both ways are exclusive. But the Christian faith, the gospel joyfully says, what you've done doesn't matter. What you will do, it it doesn't matter. It, It doesn't matter whether you've been right at the gates of hell. You are welcome into the family of God because Jesus has made a way. Jesus is the only way because he's the only substitute. He's the only one who has lived the perfect life for us. He's the only one who's died on the cross for us. He is the one. And this is so central that Jesus says, listen, don't miss this. There's going to be those who come along and they're going to, they're going to deceive many. And we're going to have to understand. Here's my word for our graduates, for all of us today. He shows us how we can be discerning by by reminding us or really teaching us the problem. Here's how I'll break this down. The problem of doctrine, the paradox of religion and the pattern of grace. First, the problem of doctrine. By doctrine, of course, we mean teaching, the truth of God's word. Now, this seems self-evident, right? Output comes from input. Uh, What what comes out of our lives, every action is is because of some form of belief, right? Right? So here's the problem of doctrine. The problem of doctrine is that bad teaching leads to bad living. Now again, you say, well, that that seems self-evident, but Jesus says, "Not, not so fast. Not all is as it appears to be. It is true that bad doctrine leads to bad living, but we can't always discern bad doctrine. Look at what he says in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. He says, watch out. There are, there are those who look like sheep, but they're not. There's a deception to doctrine. There's a deception going on here. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul speaks of people within the church. This is where we find the false prophets. And in our day, you can find them on YouTube. It's the celebrity pastor. This is a, a famous thing, you know, right? That people get all these followings now. And, and, and how can you discern Whether he's a true prophet, she's a true prophet or not. Paul says that they're in the church and these, they look like sheep. They disguise themselves as sheep, just as Satan, he says, disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan is a deceiver. He he brings division. How can you spot him? They look like sheep, smell like sheep, act like sheep, talk like sheep. How can you tell Verse 16, you'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, one way to frame this, this is so important to understand. The way that you determine uh, two things, there's, there's right doctrine and there's right living. Okay? Good teaching, good living. But here, let's think about some types that we see in the New Testament. 
Um, we see them in the Old Testament, but some types of false teachers. Watch for these. False teachers include heretics. Okay, they're just off, away from biblical, historical, orthodox uh, Christianity. Have a doctrine that they're teaching that's heretical. There's charlatans, right? Those who pretend to be shepherds of God's people but desire a following. For some personal gain, 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, they crave controversy, slander, imagining that godliness is a means towards gain. So they leverage this. Other false prophets have some kind of new truth. Young people, watch for this. Never heard of this before. This is the new thing. I've got a new revelation. If it doesn't match up with historical orthodox Christianity, then it's, it's, it's not not godly it's not from the lord others are simply abusers there are those who find themselves in a prominent place do they always start out this way uh you know perhaps not probably not i think of many who have fallen prominent leaders who gain a platform then running over people for their own gain and their own good some pastors allow the church to become their life and adulteress and they'll do whatever it takes and we find this and nowadays again with famous preacher types who fall we all know stories right fall into sexual sin or financial uh, sin and so often we discover they were not accountable they, they weren't in a, in a church or a place maybe they had this platform now they're just speaking out and doing all the stuff and all the things and they become popular and we're not meant to be famous We were not created to be, there's only one who's famous and it is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Another false teacher is one who is the divider, creating rifts within the body, creating division, gossiping about others, gossiping about leadership or some member or person in the church. And in Jude 18 and 19, it says they're they're scoffers devoid of the spirit. But false teachers are hard to spot, Jesus tells us. It's subtle. Look at verse 17. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. What kind of people do they produce is one question. If I were to tell you I had a lemon tree in my backyard, uh, what might I offer to you as proof? A lemon, good. See our graduates, they, they they know what's up. A lemon. Now, if I brought one and said, here it is, and you said, Jeff, you got that from Tom Thumb, I would say, you're right, I did. I don't have a lemon tree in my backyard. But it came from a lemon tree. It didn't come from an apple tree. A, 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 a tree is going to bear the fruit. This is what he's saying. It, it's it's going to bear good fruit. Diseased trees, the bad fruit is going to come. How do they gain an audience is a question. Among people who don't know the truth. Those who cannot discern from what's true and not true. And and I've thought a lot about, in our context, what would false teaching be in our context? Like North Dallas uh, in in, in America. I don't know know where you're heading, but I've thought a lot about this, read a lot about it. Thought about it a lot uh, for today. It's, it's, It's most often Jesus plus something. Satan has this strategy. If you can't beat them, join them. So he joins in, and any time we allow the gospel or the church to be co-opted by anything else, or my own personal life, leads to a falsehood, even false teaching, false living. Jesus plus secular culture. Jesus plus a secular lifestyle. Jesus plus the blessings of this world, if you will. Jesus plus added uh, pleasure. Jesus plus money, fame, power and often we run to politics in our day for power believing that worldly power is how the kingdom is going to advance now it's important politics are very important but satan is a deceiver and a divider this past week several of you sent me an article from the atlantic that i I read the title of it by Tim Alberta, How Politics Poisoned the Evangelical Church. 
the subtitle, How the Movement Spent 40 Years at War with Secular America. Now it's at war with itself. And Satan has sifted us like wheat. And we're losing the power of, of a winsome witness in the world. And I just want to pause and say this, friends, the enemy of the church is not a political party. The enemy of the church is disunity. Disunity in the larger body of Christ. And Jesus, so much so, Jesus prays all the things he could have prayed in his high priestly prayer. In John 17, he says, Lord, keep them united. Keep them united. See, disunity is a choice. Disunity is always a choice. There's going to be difference of opinion and we can sort through that together and even when we disagree, point to Christ who is the one who unites us. Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Greater is he who unites us than anything else in the world. But if we go Jesus plus, we end up seeing how Satan is a deceiver and a divider. So when there's this fusion uh, of anything that we make really our God, our idol. What we hope will provide for us what only God can. Then we're in trouble. Jesus will not be co-opted. And, and so what we, what we need to rest on, here's part of our, our true doctrine and power, is, is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit ultimately to love others as he loves us. To be obedient, to live faithful lives for him, which is my prayer, the prayer of our parents, our families, all of us for our graduates. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when speaking of people who are doctrinally sound but closed to the direct supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, can be a temptation in our culture. He, he, he described them this way. Totally orthodox. Totally useless. You can have right doctrine with no power of the spirit in your life. Jesus says in verse 18, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. A striking image of coming judgment for these false prophets, teachers, and false disciples. Those who think they get it, but they don't. The problem with our doctrine is that bad doctrine leads to bad living and it shows up in our lives even when it's some hybrid of something that is not the kingdom of God. So let's talk about the paradox of religion. The paradox of religion, see there's a twist and it's this. The paradox of religion is that good living does not lead to eternal living. This is the delusion of religion. It's meant to bring life, but it brings death. There's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it leads to death. I, I often say it's, it, it's not so much that it leads to death, but it seems so right. There's, there's a deception that the evil one wants to bring to all of us. The delusion of religion is that I can try to look good, act good, and, and be moral and not know Christ at all. And that's not the Zoe, abundant life that Jesus has offered to us. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Again, this is one of the most troubling passages in all of scripture. And by the way, Lord, Lord, this is an oral confession. They're saying, I am, I am with him. I'm with him. Look at verse 22. On that day, keep that phrase in mind. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? I don't know how many of you have cast out demons, uh, but they're doing miraculous things. What is happening here? You see, Lord, Lord is, Lord was the, the name for Yahweh. They're addressing Jesus as Yahweh with an endearing uh, doubling, okay, with a kind of a superlative emphasis. Lord, Lord, Yahweh. You could say he had the good doctrine, right doctrine, 
completely devoid of, of a relationship with God at all. And yet doing these things, they're doing service. This should trouble all of us, frankly. They claim power in Jesus' name, but their activities are meaningless because of their motives. They don't know him at all. Mighty works are not proof of God's will or action because they can come from other sources, we learn through scripture. Demons, I think most often in our case, human invention, hard work, giving glory to God. And, and, and yet, a, devoid of the power of the spirit, only human power, bringing glory to ourselves. Look at verse 23. And then, we, then, then will I declare, Jesus will make the declaration to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, he says. They had, here's the, here, here it is. They had no relationship with him at all. They had no relationship with him. So, so how do you know? Well, one way to put it, again, if you think you get it, but you have no relationship with him, you don't have an ongoing daily walk with him, intimacy with him, you don't get it. If you think you get it regarding your good works, you've done enough, you're going to bring something to the table. If you think you get it, you don't get it because you don't get him. You don't have him. And apart from him, the one who makes the declaration, the one who can say, yes, you're in, no, you're out, is Christ himself because he is the way. The narrow way is Christ himself. People say, you know, Jeff, not, not, all, uh, not all people or all roads pass lead to God. I, I often say, no, yeah, they do. They all lead to God. They all lead to Christ. And in Hebrews it says, it's destined for every person to die once and face judgment. Judgment based on what you did with Christ. Did you, did you rely on your good works and your efforts or did you fall before the Savior who's given his life for you, the only way to eternal life? So what is it? There's a problem of doctrine. There's the paradox of religion. Finally, the pattern of grace. You know, you get it when you don't get it and you're in need of rescue. And so what's become a pattern in your life and it all starts, friends, this is for someone here today. It all starts when you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ. You've never received his grace and today is your day. Today is the day because the pattern of grace leads to fruitful teaching and fruitful living. This is the only way you get both good fruit see, from, from good doctrine. And it's the doctrine of grace, not works. You're constantly going back in need of the Savior, recognizing your sin. And the more you grow in him, the more you see your sin. The more you realize you've got to keep going back to him. Grace is not a one-time stop. You keep going back to him over and over again. Friend, have you come to this point in your life? Is your life marked by being defined by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you prone to go into work, 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 work until you, until you just about self-destruct? And then you finally run back to him, perhaps. Some live that way. You can remain in him by going back to him. The pattern of grace means I confess my sin. I repent of it. And the pattern of grace is living in the body. You can't claim that you love Jesus and not love his church. You, you can't claim that you committed faithfully to him, but you're not in community with other believers. I mean, like doing life together, being accountable and helping each other grow and, 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 and learn how to follow him. And we know this, the fruit of the spirit. What does it look like? It looks like Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. He, he fills us with his spirit and we live like this. Does, do those words mark your life? That's the fruit. That is what the world needs to see. And are you telling your story? 
Are you so transformed by the love of Jesus that you, you say, this is my story. Some of you know the great reformer Martin Luther um, had this, this grace awakening when he read Romans 1, 16 and 17, which says, for, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first, also to the Greek. And then it was verse 17, for in it, okay, look at this, the gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith for faith or from faith to faith. It's faith at the beginning, faith at the end. It's always faith, not works. It is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And he said, that revelation changed his life and he was standing at the gate of paradise. And he realized, Jesus has done it all. And so he gave his life to the Lord. Have you come to that point? And it doesn't mean that your life's just gonna be all roses and, and, and simple from that point on. Martin Luther struggled with depression. He writes of three days, he was in such a depressive state. His family uh, was there, his kids, his wife, and he's off in, in a room, he can't even get out of bed. And he tells of his, the struggles that he had and Satan's attacks on his life. And yet he stayed true, running back to grace. And as I close, you, you need to hear this, friends. In verse 22, 23, again, on that day, there's coming a day, there's coming a day when we will all stand before God and, and, and those who have not received Christ will spend eternity apart from him. Those who have by faith will be able to join Paul and all the others when he said in Philippians 2 that God has exalted, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Friend, there's coming a day you will bow down to him. Everyone will bow down to him. You can bow now. If you wait until later, he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you now, each of us individually, you know our hearts, you know us, you know each of us. Test our hearts. Friend, if you're here in, in, in this moment, or you're hearing my, my voice and you, you don't know for certain, you need to give your heart to Jesus right now. Just say yes to him. Say, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life in response, a life of worship. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. And for all of us, friends, would today be the day that you commit yourself anew to him? What will it be? Commit to joining the fellowship of the church today. Commit to baptism, a proclamation. Not hiding out or, or living a secret life, but to proclaim that he's Lord of your life. To, to commit to service out of a pure motivation of heart. Commit to joining a community group of people in a connect group or small group. What will you do? Lord, we thank you for, for your gift of grace to us. We're overwhelmed today that we can call you Father, our Savior, our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen.